sees you taking on the role of any of the Simpsons clan, be it Homer, Marge, Bart or Lisa. The storyline of the game sees Wayland Smithers do a daring jewellery raid in broad daylight, bumping into Homer and losing the jewel to Maggie who uses it as a pacifier. Smithers then steals Maggie away and leads the Simpsons on a whirlwind madcap chase throughout Springfield itself, taking in Krustyland, Springfield Butt, the Discount Cemetery, your own dreamlike state in the Dream Sequence level, Moe's Tavern, Channel 6 Studio, and then finally onto the nuclear power plant for a final confrontation with Wayland Smithers. And after you've defeated him, you then have to face off against Mr. Burns, who's in a robo suit, as well as dealing with Burns' goons. You'll also have to deal with zombies and Bigfoots along the way. And the Bigfoots look strangely like Homer, but have got a lot more hair. Now the game did see some home ports, but only for the Commodore 64 and PC. When the Xbox 360 came around, they actually released it on the Xbox Live Marketplace along with the X-Men arcade game, also from Konami. However, along with that game, they were removed shortly after due to licensing issues. That being said, in 2021, Arcade 1UP did release an arcade cabinet of the Simpsons Arcade along with Simpsons Bowling and it can be yours for just a measly 300 quid. So even after 31 years, Simpsons Arcade is still a great little beat-em-up and it would make a fantastic fighting license triple along with Turtles Arcade and Asterix. Wow, man. I'm Bart Simpson. Who the hell are you? The second Simpsons game, also released in 1991, was the one that saw the widest release appearing on no fewer than nine machines, and it was that intro sequence on the Amiga version that wowed me on Christmas morning. Designed by Imagineering, 
The plot is very much like a Simpsons reworking of John Carpenter's They Live, but sets out on a five level journey to try and thwart the alien's invasion of Earth. The game starts in downtown Springfield, with the first objective being to get rid of the purple coloured objects the aliens need for their weapon. Along the way, you'll meet disguised aliens who you'll need to jump on their heads off, and once you've done this, you'll find that they've dropped proof which you will need to convince the rest of the Simpsons clan to actually help you in your journey. The levels range from the aforementioned downtown to Krusty Land, the Springfield Mall, the Springfield Museum and finally the nuclear power plant with the objectives changing from level to level. The first level is purple objects, the second is balloons, the third is hats, the fourth is exit signs and on the very last level at the power plant you'll need uranium rods. Each level has a different Simpson to help you, with Maggie on the Springfield level, Lisa on the Krusty Land level, Marge at the mall, Homer at the museum, and then all four of the Simpsons family on the final level. The levels also have puzzle elements too, such as buying a wrench in the tool store to use on a fire hydrant. This in turn will wash off the wet purple paint from an awning, using a cherry bomb to scare a purple bird, and firing rockets to get rid of purple curtains at the retirement home. Now as I said, it was released on no fewer than nine consoles and computers, ranging from the Amiga, the Atari ST, to the Amstrad 464, the Commodore 64, the ZX Spectrum, the consoles of the Sega Mega Drive, Master System, Game Gear and Nintendo Entertainment System, with Acclaim handling the console versions and Ocean managing the home micro-releases. Though I have to say, my all-time favourite version of this game is the Amiga. It was the one that I played first, and as I say, the intro sequence absolutely wowed nine-year-old me. However, that being said, the parallax scrolling backgrounds on the Mega Drive version are actually much better than on the Amiga. However, on the whole, I would take the Amiga version every day. Created by Distinctive Software and published by Konami in 1991 in their second attempt at releasing a Simpsons game, the plot sees Bart grounded by Homer and Marge after pulling one too many pranks again. However, after getting bored in his room, he decides to escape, and that's when the adventure begins. The levels are accessed via the house, which acts as a hub. One of the levels has Bart inside an episode of Itchy and Scratchy, while another has him exploring the attic. And the final level has Bart trying to rescue Krusty from his old nemesis, Sideshow Bob. Along the way, you'll encounter various enemies. Instead of the standard energy bar, Bart has a call meter. And whenever you miss said enemy, they'll hit you and the meter drops. However, if you find a cool item such as a donut, your meter builds back up. And to help Bart fight back, he has an array of weapons which are scattered around the place for you to pick up. Such as the burp gun the slingshot and the spray paint. Now the enemies range from spiders to ghosts to scratchy in a chef's uniform to bees and to others. As I said before, the house itself acts as a hub for all the levels. Going into the closet gives you access to the aforementioned itchy and scratchy level and also the space mutants level. Going left twice accesses the attic level and going out of Bart's bedroom window accesses the level that sees you having to try and get Maggie's ball back. While the graphics and sound bites of Bart are pretty good, 
The gameplay lets it down by being too hard, with enemies constantly respawning and the aiming not being good enough. The game itself can be run on an online emulator, as offline it refuses to run on a modern Windows 10 PC. And if you try to look for a copy, there were none on eBay or on any of the buying sites on the internet at the time of writing. However, if I'm honest, I'd leave the game alone. And while it's a good attempt at trying something different, it falls a little flat in the gameplay area. Still, the intro's not too bad. The first of the Game Boy exclusives by Imagineering, the story sees Bart and Lisa packed off to the dreaded Camp Deadly, ruled over by its counsellor, Iron Fist Burns. After deciding that enough is enough after having one too many kelp burgers, Bart and Lisa hatch a plan to escape during the flag capture exercise. Starting off in the camp grounds, you compete in the flag capture with the other campers and counsellors all fighting against you. Luckily, Lisa is on hand with weapons and other various items like beekeeper suits and extra hit points at various points of the game, which can also be gained from some other counsellors as you hit them with your boomerangs. As well as the flag capture, you also have to start food fights in the food hall while not getting caught. After each section in this area, if you food left over, you can get an extra hit point for every 5 items you chuck in the bin. And after you complete the second part of the flag capture, that's when your escape begins through the countryside, traversing underground caverns and then over and through Mount Springfield, all while fighting off bats, spiders, skeletons and other nasties all wanting to keep you from escaping, all leading up to your final encounter with Iron Fist Burns himself and your freedom. Along the way, you'll have to climb into tree houses and defeat their owners, and you'll also have the option to free Madman Mort from the snare he's caught in. You'll also have to cross streams, avoid hornets and bees, and dodge fish, all while still outrunning the counsellors trying to take you back to camp alive. Although the game is short, and is completable within 25 minutes, it's not actually that bad a game. It's got some pretty good graphics, not bad gameplay, some good speech, and some pretty good music. Although one of the things that does seem to let it down is that the controls seem a bit too heavy meaning you have to really press those buttons in to get Bart to walk, jump and fire his way to freedom. But, for a 25 minute distraction, I can't think of a better way to spend those 25 minutes. Another 1991 release, Bart vs. the World sees our little yellow troublemaker enter an art competition on the Krusty the Clown show to win a chance at going around the world treasure hunt for rare Krusty items and other piddling crap. However, the competition is rigged by Mr. Burns so Bart wins, enabling him to try and carry out his plan on getting rid of the Simpsons family once and for all, aided by his own brood all from around the world like Fu Manchu Burns in China. Playing as Bart, the game is split up into a variety of mini-games, ranging from platform levels to card matching, a slide puzzle, and others like racing along the Great Wall of China on your skateboard, or dodging fire-breathing dragons, holes, and utilising jumps. The game saw a much smaller release, this time on just the Amiga, ST, NES, Game Gear and Master System, all of which vary in graphical quality, with some versions omitting the intro and even mini-games, and the Amiga version having no sound effects at all, just the music. While Imagineering handled the NES version, Art Developments handled the other versions, and they're a mixed bag altogether, with the game getting mixed reviews at the time. And I have to say, from playing all the versions, no one version is better than the other, as the game is actually pretty poor whatever you play it on. The sliding puzzle is infuriating, the card matching game is tedious, while the platform levels feel unfinished, though on some versions the graphics are pretty good, and so is the music. Which is nice. Overall, it's one to avoid. There are better Simpsons games out there, so do yourself a favour and go play them instead. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Developed this time by Audiogenic across all the platforms, Funhouse sees you as Krusty the Clown, and it's your job to help get rid of all the mice that have infested the place. With Bart helping by using the Mouse Whacker machine, the game is more puzzle based, with you using blocks to get the mice to their final destination, and even repairing pipes by dropping the relevant part into the space to complete the pipework. Each level is huge, with secret areas to explore for bonus points and even extra lives. There are also baddies to dispatch with your trusty crusty brand custard pies, and you can even break certain walls with bouncing balls too. Plus in certain levels, hitting certain blocks will open up secret areas in the main game, and if you complete the level in time, you get a time bonus on top as well. Released on the Amiga, DOS, NES, SNES, Mega Drive, Game Gear, Master System and Game Boy, each version has minor differences. While some are cosmetic, some are to do with the level design. The Amiga version, for instance, has a proper status bar at the bottom of the gameplay area instead of what the Super Nintendo has with it being within it, and also has that Amiga feel to it with the music. Plus you have to press fire to enter a level instead of pressing up. The SNES version, meanwhile, has more graphical effects as seen in the game's intro sequence. The NES version is the most different, however, with the levels being larger than the other versions. That being said, every conversion is extremely fun to play and to me is one of the best Simpsons games made, so no matter what version you choose, you're guaranteed a great game. The second Game Boy exclusive sees you again as Bart, but this time competing on a game show that's suspiciously like Gladiators, but without Jet. You compete in a variety of games while trying to win a set amount of money each week. Reach the total and you'll progress to the next. The events range from a daredevil ride down a ramp in an effort to knock a juggernaut off a podium, to traverse an electrified floor to score baskets on the other side with the floor changing every so often. This is one, along with Versus the World, I get frustrated with the most. Graphically and sonically, it's not too bad, but what lets it down is the difficulty, especially on the electrified floor basketball event. It's one I've never been able to get past, so I've no idea what the other events are like. At all. Period. On the upside, you can select what event you want to do next, and even what event you want to start off with, and you even get tips from some of Springfield's celebrities between the events. Also between the events, you'll also get a rundown of your score from the previous event from Dr. Marvin Munro and Kent Brockman, and they even do some commentary on how you did. Apart from that, there really isn't anything to recommend this game whatsoever. It's just too frustrating to be enjoyable, and good graphics do not a good game make. One to avoid. Sculptured Software are on coding duties this time for this game, and it's... well... it's a weird game all round. The story sees Bart falling asleep while doing his homework. When wind blows his papers out of the window, you have to traverse Bart's dreams while recovering his homework. The game is a series of mini-games, with one seeing you inflate germs in the bloodstream a la Dick Dug, and another sees you as Indiana Bart, going through catacombs and whatnot, and another as Bartzilla, stomping around destroying things while another sees you going after Richie and Scratchy. All the levels are accessed via Evergreen Terrace. Going to either left or right, the place actually wraps around meaning you'll always go past the Simpson abode, and it's while walking that you'll come across sheets of homework which, with which to access the levels. However, Every so often, Otto comes along in the school bus with which you'll have to avoid, along with Lisa, who turns you into a frog, snappy mailboxes, the head of Jebediah Springfield, flying saxophones and others. 
your energy bar is a sleep meter, which means every time you get hit, the meter goes down, which means you're waking up. When it goes down fully, the screen goes to white while still retaining objects outlines, as if it's a drawing. One more hit means Bart wakes up, and the game ends. The game was released on just the Sega Mega Drive and the Super Nintendo, and they both play roughly the same. The only differences are between the opening door animation of the SNES and Bart falling through the door on the Mega Drive when you find a homework page and also the music. Although it's not a bad game, it's not one I'd seek out, but if you're just looking to waste 20 minutes here and there, then I suppose you could do worse. Starting off with that cutscene to introduce the plot. The game sees you as Bart's alter ego, Bartman, on a quest to save his comic book hero, Radioactive Man, who's been stripped of his powers and sent to the Limbo Zone, which is located on the edge of a black hole. It's up to Bartman to fight the villains, get back Radioactive Man's powers, and bust him out. Throughout the levels, Bart can pick up lightning bolts which give him the ability to fire lasers from his eyes and this is in addition to his punches and kicks that he can use to dispatch his enemies. Add in to this exclamation marks that you can pick up for extra points. At the end of every level you have one of Radioactive Man's enemies which you have to dispatch before you can get the superpower back and then go on to the next level. The game was only released on the NES from again Imagineering and on the Game Gear from Teeny Weeny Games. It also is not, again, one of the better games. It's more frustrating with poor level design and lacklustre controls. And evidence of this is on the first level of the junkyard. After a while you have to jump up a huge stack of junk, but you have no idea what you can and can't walk on, and you also have no idea what you can and can't jump onto, which means you will constantly be falling to your deaths and starting all over again. Plus, you can also fall through the pressure arms for the junk mashers, which to me indicates pretty poor design. Add into this the frequent leaps of faith, and you have a game that, although it does look okay, no matter what system you play it on, it is possibly one of the worst programmed games I have ever come across. A third of the Game Boy exclusives, and made by Software Creations, sees you play once more as Bart, but this time he's in the role of Jack from the Jack in the Beanstalk story. Using your trusty slingshot, you have to dispatch bugs and other enemies while climbing to the top of said beanstalk, going through the various levels of the giant's castle, and then going back down. Other weapons include dynamite to get rid of the enemies on screen and paper aeroplanes. 
Along with jumping on springy leaves to get higher, you have to climb vines to collect coins, while avoiding bees and thorns. Speaking of coins, you have a set amount to collect on each level before progressing to the next. With a cartoon feel to the graphics, some good sound effects and, I must admit, not a bad music track, it's let down by an unforgiving difficulty level that saw me not even being able to get off the first level, as seen in the video. And this had been mentioned in the reviews for the game at the time, with some even mentioning the screen being more cramped than previous offerings, which I do find myself actually agreeing with. Mind you, it could also be that I'm totally and utterly crap at it. However, if you want to have a crack at it, then go ahead and do so, but trust me, it's not a must-play game. Thank you all. Bye. With sculptured software, again on coding duties, the game is a collection of mini games with levels ranging from being Bart as a baby, as a dinosaur, as a pig trying to escape Krusty's slaughterhouse, to throwing tomatoes at people to try and ruin the school picture, riding the tubes at Mount Splashmore, and racing towards the nuclear power plant in a Mad Max style post apocalyptic level. The plot of the game sees Bart try out Martin Prince's educational virtual reality machine at the school science fair. However, Bart being the brat he is, breaks it which inadvertently traps him in the virtual reality world, and only by completing the six levels can Bart really escape. It's not a bad plot, and the levels are selected by a roulette wheel. Plus, you can even practice the levels before you play the game properly and the levels themselves, they aren't too bad, with the Doomsday Bart level being the standout of the whole game, with the Mega Drive version showing the machine had near enough the same graphical clout as the SNES, as it is quite visually impressive. The fourth Game Boy exclusive was handled by Beam Software, and sees the cat and mouse duo take to the mini golf fairways for some under par carnage. You play as Scratchy, and you have nine lives with which to survive the mayhem. Along the way, Itchy tries to hamper Scratchy's progress by violent means, either by knife, bazooka, flamethrower, or by any other sharp and pointy implement. However, you can fight fire with water yourself by finding weapons along the way, like baseball bats, throwing knives and bombs, all to cause the same amount of carnage to that little sod as he causes to you, all the while trying to putt your ball. The levels themselves are a side-scrolling affair, with a different theme to each, and with the first level being based on fairy tales, called Grim Fairy Tales. Throughout the levels you'll find lifts to get to other areas, and said weapons dotted about for you to find. The graphics themselves are pretty damn good, and the courses are quite fiendish in themselves, not to mention that little sod popping up every so often to hamper your progress. You'll also get golfing tips from Krusty himself, though they're not so much tips, but instead just saying things like, stand next to the ball. You know, stuff that's common sense. Because Itchy is an annoying little git, it does make the game a tad infuriating, as he pops up quite a lot. However, it isn't a bad game, and there is some fun to be had. Along with Camp Deadly, it is one of the better Game Boy exclusives. Developed by Bits, the Itchy and Scratchy game sees you as Itchy, with the mayhem starting in the Jurassic setting, with you not only popping Scratchy on the head with a wooden mallet, but also cave Scratchies as well. Your goal, from what I can make out, is to inflict as much damage on Scratchy as possible to progress to the next level. 
Along the way there were pickups for health to get and also things like sharp objects to avoid. And while it did receive a full release for the SNES and Game Gear, the Sega Mega Drive version was cancelled when it was nearly fully complete, though it would be the last Simpsons game released for the aging 16-bit consoles. Plus, it was also censored on the Super Nintendo, with several dying animations being cut, whereas the unreleased Mega Drive version was intact. Graphically, it's sound retaining all the mayhem from the cartoon within a cartoon. Most of the time, sadly, you'll be frustrated with it instead of enjoying it, as the gameplay is, in my opinion, on the hard side. However, I'm certain, underneath, there is a good game struggling to come out. Welcome to Springfield. I'm Troy McClure. You may remember me as town spokesman for such computer travel guides as Fredonia Gateway to Wichita and Fairbanks Needs Women. Of course, we all know Springfield for its award-winning dandelions and as birthplace of the glove compartment. But that's merely scratching the surface of a place the great Calvin Coolidge once labeled a pea-sized town with lima bean-sized dreams. So warm up your clicking finger and let's explore a land the poets call Springfield, USA! <clears throat> Have you ever wanted to tour Springfield? Visit the Quickie Mart? Snoop around the Simpsons home or even have a couple of games of Larry the Looter? Then Virtual Springfield is for you! Featuring locales from the series up to that point, you can visit Krusty Loo Studios, the nuclear power plant, Moe's Tavern and many other places. Plus there's mini games like Sideshow Bob poster shooting with Bart Slingshot, throwing water balloons in the back garden and throwing popcorn at people in the Aztec Theatre. The game uses a point and click interface with your pointer turning yellow for where you can move to, to interact with objects and to pick things up. When moving around the map, you stop at junctions, and you also have a handy map to show you all the points of interest. Along the way, various characters of the show pop up, like an introduction by Troy McClure. You may remember him from such trained videos as Alice's Adventures Through the Windshield Glass, Patty and Selma, Grandpa, and The Simpsons themselves and others. And there's even trading cards to pick up along the way too. The game, and I use the term loosely, features the original cast reprising their roles from the series with some funny lines and it also retains the humour the show was known for. Though it must be said, the animation and graphics haven't aged well at all and are indicative of the time. And although the trading card hunt is a good distraction, there's not much to come back to once it's all over and done with. Although, if you're a Simpsons aficionado, you might get some enjoyment out of it. The only release on the Game Boy Color, and the last of the overall Game Boy exclusives, see you play as, surprise surprise, Bart, but this time you also get to play as the other family members as well on their own levels. Bart has him trying to rescue Santa's little helper, Marge fights zombies, and Homer has three levels all to himself. Each of the side-scrolling levels are taken from various stories from the Treehouse of Terror Halloween episodes, made by Software Creations, and the only entry to be published by THQ, the game got mixed reviews upon release. The first level has you play as Bart, and your mission is to try and find two fuses to bring back the power. 
The first part sees you go into the basement to get the first views, while the second part sees you go under the house to find the second and last views, while avoiding all manner of nasties and pools of radioactive waste. Once that's done, you can begin your journey to try and rescue Santa's little helper. Now, I only played this game recently, and I have to admit, it's not actually all that bad. It looks pretty damn good while taking full advantage of the Game Boy Color's extensive palette, with some tricky level layouts and some pretty good music. And also, the controls aren't too bad either. So, if you can, it's well worth checking out. Barney Gumbel versus Marge Simpson. The turn of the decade brought with it a new developer and a new distributor for the games of our favourite Yellow family, starting off with Simpsons Wrestling. Now it was developed by Big Ape Games and Fox Interactive, and was published by Electronic Arts. Taking the standard wrestling game and adding a Simpsons twist, you pick your wrestler from many of the different inhabitants of Springfield, and then go toe to toe with others over two bouts each. Now what makes this game stand out is that each wrestler has a weapon that they use. Barney, for example, has beer glasses, Marge has a frying pan, while groundskeeper Willie has a rake. You can also pick up speech bubbles, and these in turn fill up your taunt meter. This in turn, once filled, enables you to have invulnerability for a short period of time. There are even special moves too, like Willie throwing down bear traps and Barney unleashing a noxious burp cloud. These are in addition to the standard moves that each character uses and each fight takes place in a different area of Springfield, with different graphics in the ring centre to represent the different areas. For example, at City Hall, you have Mayor Quimby in the middle with the words Vote Quimby, and you can also unlock bonus characters as you progress through the game. Now, while it does have some of the trademark humour from the show, the game is simply button mashing of the highest order, and hoping that you get in more hits than your opponent, which places this a bit on the shallow end of the gaming spectrum. The graphics are cell shaded and while they merely look okay, they err on the side of Scrappy. On the plus side, all the actors came back to do the voices of their characters, so there is that bit of authenticity to it. But it can't save a game that, after the Simpsons novelty has worn off, is just a simple wrestling game. And it's as basic as you can get. Quit playing those stupid video games, boy. I want to watch TV. We're live in front of City Hall as joyless plutocrat Montgomery Burns is about to unveil his new line of nuclear-powered buses. Behold the Burns Atomic Megabus. Faster, cheaper, and completely safe. Please kill me. Those radioactive buses are a threat to the public health. Threat to public health, eh? That gives me an idea. What do you think? Just get to the game already! For the first Simpsons game on the PS2, Xbox and GameCube, Road Rage takes the premise of Crazy Taxi and injects some Springfield humour to the proceedings. Your job is to take on Mr. Burns' new nuclear-powered buses through various locales around Springfield, be it Downtown, Evergreen Terrace, and many others. In addition to the main mission mode, you can drive around the maps at your leisure too, as well as engage in Road Rage mode, which is your basic crazy taxi mode. Here you can earn money to unlock other characters, such as Professor Frink, Otto, Fat Tony, Krusty, and a whole host of others, with each one in a different car. The missions vary from protection to stealth, and once completed unlock locations and, as in road rage mode as well, other drivers too. Because of the game's likeness to Crazy Taxi, Sega even filed a lawsuit against EA, Fox Interactive and Radical, which was eventually settled for an unknown amount and also done in private. Now the reviews at the time were average, with some criticising the gameplay, and even criticising the controls as well, calling them slippery. However, 
That being said, I didn't actually find the controls that bad. In actual fact, I found the vehicles controlled exactly the same as in Crazy Taxi, with even skidding round the corners with just the slightest tap of the controls. It does lack a bit of depth, however, having said that, it is fun while it lasts. Coded by the Code Monkeys and wanting to cash in on the skateboarding trend of the time, The Simpsons Skateboarding sees Springfield turned into a huge skate park, with you picking from one of four characters with another five unlockable for the annual skate tour, and each character having their own attributes. There are four single player modes in total, Free Skate, Skateboard Horse, Trick Contest and Skate Fest, with you being able to unlock extras as you progress. There's also a two-player skate-off contest as well, and as well as this, there is also a skills school mode to learn tricks and moves before taking on the actual game. Who's, who spells skills at the end with a Z? Who, who still does that? It's just... Ugh. It's often been criticised as one of the worst Simpsons games made, with everything from the graphics, sound and music, controls and lack of tricks coming under fire. And while I think it doesn't look too bad, I do have to agree that, that the controls leave a lot to be desired. They're just too clunky and too unresponsive. Plus the commentating with Kent Brockman, saying what trick you've pulled off and when you've come a cropper gets old very, very quickly. And even the music is poor. It's made to sound like something Real Big Fish came up with, but instead it actually sounds awful. Like someone tried to fart the Simpsons theme into a microphone. With a bit more spit and polish, it could have been a good little Tony Hawk's ripoff, but sadly instead it's nothing more than a blatant cheap cashing job that doesn't do anything the Tony Hawk's games can do, and do better. a new cola, kids, and this one isn't poisonous to anybody. That we know of. New and improved Buzz Cola is made from only the finest sugars and waters. Plus, it has a special ingredient, too hot, for the FDA. It'll give you the get up and go you need to do all the pathetic stuff you have to do. Try new improved Buzz Cola. Mmm, cola. Must get Buzz Cola. <laughs> Simpsons game takes its inspiration from Grand Theft Auto. Controlling various characters throughout the game, the plot sees our favourite yellow family investigates mysteries going on in Springfield, such as crop circles, robot wasps, security cameras, and a new ingredient in Buzz Cola, which all lead up to a bigger conspiracy. Taking a third person perspective, you can run, kick and collect various items like trading cards and coins, the latter of which you can use to buy new outfits. That's if you really want to see Homer running around in just these tidy whities You can also smash the Buzz Cola windows for extra coins too, as well as things like phone boxes, Buzz Cola crates and machines, and even trees and lampposts, all of which also give you coins. Smashing into other cars and people builds up your yellow meter around the mini-map in the bottom right hand corner of the screen. If you fill it up, Springfield's worst will try and stop you. All while doing various missions like delivering Lisa's science project to her in school before Seymour Skinner arrives. 
It was released on the GameCube, PS2, Xbox and then on the PC, coming two months later. Like Road Rage, it sold 3 million copies and is considered to be the best Simpsons tie-in game made, although some criticism was levelled at some bugs and some glitches. I do have to agree, it is one of the best Simpsons games made. It looks great, is fun to play, and as always, has that authenticity with the actual actors doing the voices of their respective characters. In other words, it comes highly recommended. Wow, chocolate half bright. Excuse me, Tutty, you're eating our world. Hey, you like that rabbit thing from that book about a girl named Alice who goes to Wonderland. What was it called? Oh, yeah. No white and stupid town. For your information, I am the white chocolate rabbit. Hey, white chocolate's not even chocolate. It doesn't even contain cocoa salad. Well, if I'm not real chocolate, then you probably wouldn't be interested in eating me. <laughs> Ooh, white chocolate. So here we are. The last of the current Simpsons games. Before they became... Nothing more than something to take money from your pockets, mobile phone games. And it's also the final game of the video too. Which is a shame. But the plot sees the Simpsons learn they're part of a game, and have to fight their way through four scenarios which are parodies of other games in an effort to save their 8-bit versions. Taking control of various family members, each have their own special moves. Bart, for example, can use his slingshot, while Homer has poisonous burps. Bart can also become his alter ego, Bartman, and glide from high areas. Plus, you can switch between two characters at a time, using one's abilities to help the other. Along the way, you can also pick up Duff beer bottle caps to unlock extras too, and in self-referential humour, the first time you activate usual game troops, comic book guy pops up with information as well. There's also local drop-in multiplayer too, should you need any help. The game itself isn't actually that bad. The first couple of levels I played were pretty fun, with the first level taking place in Homer's Chocolate Land Daydream, with you having to punch chocolate bunnies and eating what's left behind, all while chasing the white chocolate bunny to a massive birthday cake. It also has proper animation for the cutscenes in between levels that adds a little something to the game. Now while the game is fun, the problem comes in the form of the control... While the game is fun, the problem comes in the form of the camera system. It's pretty poor, and sometimes it doesn't let you see what you need to. Plus, it's quite slow to move as well. Xbox 360, PS3, PSP, Nintendo Wii, or the Nintendo DS, you're well catered for as it was released on these consoles as well. Plus, every version has a variant of the cover art as well, should you wish to collect every variant available. Well, there you go. We've taken a tour around Springfield, we've taken on Aliens, Mr. Burns, and even the creator of The Simpsons as well. And all we got was this lousy t-shirt, the no good cheap rotten sons of...